Then some of the scholars introduce the translations of the word nation called nation. It was from English and Nazi is from Dutch. But these translations were not popular. People, when they talk about nation building, they were, talk, they were using that term like bangsa rather than nation. In the Philippines too, they don't really have the proper terms to reflect that particular concept. So they use nation, is from Spanish. And then the local term was bayad. In fact, the meaning is also people. So the Moro, they use the term bansa or bangsa to refer to their nation in the Philippines. What about in a Thailand? A, a Thailand, this, this is Chao Siam. Uh, I do not read Thai, but my Thai friend says it, it means this is the country or the state of Siam. In the past, Thailand was called Siam. Only in the 30s, it changed its name to Muang Thai or Thailand in English. Vietnam, perhaps I think it was also quite indigenous. It has something to do with an ethnic group called Viet. And Burma and Myanmar is also the name of the ethnic groups. But these names of the countries, I, want, I would like to say there's a very interesting here because some of the countries you can see that they are being dominated by one major ethnic group while other countries do not have any major ethnic groups in that particular area therefore it was a real multi-ethnic state without any dominant group like in Indonesia, for instance, you, know, you have about 300 ethnic groups. The largest, the Javanese, constitute less than 42% of the population. Uh, but Malaya, and then Malaysia, in fact, the majority, the dominant group, in fact, is uh, Malaya, is Malays. Now, it is interesting to note, though, when you, uh, when you have a dominant ethnic group, the name of the country often reflects that situation. Like Malaysia, Malaya, Malay is the Bumiputra, is the sons of the soil. This is, in Malay, it's called Semenanjung Melayu, you know, peninsula. Uh, Malay, the peninsula. That shows that Okay, that land belongs to one particular ethnic group. But in the Philippines, then you don't have that kind of situation because the Philippines do not have major ethnic group. And even the names of the country is imported from the West. Thailand is the land of Thai. See, then you can see that there is one major ethnic group uh, in Vietnam. This is the land of Viet, or Kin. Kin has been uh, the urban dwellers. What about Burma? Burma, Myanmar, in fact, is the name of the major ethnic group, Myanmar or Burma. So they wanted to build a nation. Some wanted to build ethno-nation, ethnic nation, as reflected in the names of the country. But in reality, they were unable to do that. They still had to build a multi-ethnic nation. So, and other a nation without that major ethnic group, it is uh, very easy to tell that they want to build multi-ethnic nation. Let us look at Singapore. Now, is Singapore a nation? I mean, when did Singapore become a nation state? Before 1965, there was no Singapore state. 
What do we have before 1965? I would like to suggest that before 1965, after the coming of the British, you know, in 1826, you have straight settlements, which consists of three units, namely Penang, Melaka, and Singapore. And these settlements became part of British Malaya. British Malaya includes the Federated Malay State as well as Unfederated Malay States. And was Singapore ever part of Malaya? I venture to say that Singapore was part of British Malaya, but it was never part of Federation of Malaya. If you look at the 1948 Federation of Malaya, for instance, Singapore was excluded. Although many people in Singapore consider themselves as part of Malaya, they even join hands with the Malay to oppose the agreement of the Federation, uh, Federation of Malaya. But they were not successful because in 1957, when the Federation of Malaya was established and Malaya became an independent country, Singapore continued to be excluded. A question can be posed here, whether or not that Singapore are really part of Malaya. I remember yeah, um, when I came here, it was in the 50s, and Singaporean, a lot of Singapore students, as well as Malayan students, consider themselves as Malayan. They do not, they did not consider themselves as Singaporeans. Like even at Nanyang University, where uh, the students as were believed to be Chinese educated, although English was also used at that particular time, they called themselves Malayan. They sang the Chinese song, but the song, the content of the song is very Malayan. I love my Malaya. <laughs> and they call themselves Malayaran, not Sinjaporan. So the concept of Singaporean, in fact, was very new. Of course, many Singaporean believe that Singapore is so small, it was not viable you know, to become an independent state, perhaps. People in Singapore wanted to join Malaya to become independent. And eventually, the dream was realized. But it did not become part of Malaya, but part of a larger unit, which is called Malaysia. The, the marriage between Singapore and Malaysia, I think, was short-lived. Malaysia was formed on the 16th of September, 1963. But Singapore left Malaysia and became independent on the 9th of August. It's less than two years. Uh, why did Singapore leave Malaysia? I think. Uh, it is a general knowledge that there was a conflict between the Prime Minister of Singapore and the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Singapore wanted to have a Malaysian Malaysia, while Malaysia wanted to have a Malaysia, a Malay Malaysia. And this 
could not be reconciled toward the end. The, the two units had to say goodbye. So, however, I would like to suggest now, when Singapore left Malaysia, Many Singaporeans and observers do not see that Singapore as a small state would be able to survive without natural resources, yeah, without um, adequate supplies. Yet, Singapore was able to survive to become prosperous and to stay as an independent political unit. In order to survive, in order to be prosperous, nation building has to be undertaken. So you can see that as soon as Singapore became an independent nation, nation building started immediately. The first phase was from 1965 to 1995. What sort of a nation that Singapore wanted to establish? What methods which were used by the government in order to build a Singapore nation? I would argue that Singapore wanted to imitate perhaps the United States because the term used was melting pot. The idea, I think, was this. Singapore should build a nation. Yeah. And gradually, ethnic city has to be erased. Because of this, when we talk about Singapore nation, you talk about Chinese Singaporeans, Indian Singaporeans, Malay Singaporeans, and Eurasian Singaporeans. So the emphasis is Singaporeans. He was expected that after a while, after a while, people of Singapore would forget their ethnicity and become a genuine Singaporeans without ethnic adjective. In addition to this, the method used to promote or to realize these sort of goals was uh, education. You know? Then you have the national type schools instead of the vernacular school. And then English was used as the language of the medium of instruction. And then in addition to this, this national service was introduced. You have a national pledge, pledge your loyalty to the state. And then you also have this HDB program, you see, uh, so that every Singaporean has a stake, as, yeah, has a stake, uh, therefore they would be ready to defend uh, their property. However, this sort of policy, in fact, is not very successful for two counts. The first one, as far as Singapore is concerned, the, the principle, in fact, is a multi-ethnic and multilingual society. You cannot just have one language. You have to have four languages. You have four official languages. And then, not only that, this melting pot concept was not successful because the people of Singapore are still deeply rooted in their ethnicity. Ethnicity, in fact, did not disappear. Seems to me that most important, perhaps, 
I think, was the policy which was introduced as early as 1982. This is the policy of the foreign talent proposed by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Foreign talent policy was proposed because he believed, sincerely believed, I think, that without this policy, Singapore would not be able to develop and survive. I just read one a passage here. It says, Singapore developed, more talents were needed. While Singapore trained talents can serve as a core, it, it is not sufficient. Lee Kuan Yew argued that our past performance was due to the extra pool of trained talents who had been naturally attracted to Singapore. Unless we set out to attract these extra brains, we should not make it into the era of the computers and the robots. He continued, if we get these extra brains in the next 20 years, we shall become a key link in a worldwide network of leading information, financial and servicing centers linked to each other by telecomputers, video telephones, jets, and perhaps space shuttles. He said in 1982, and the policy was gradually implemented. I would argue though, this the policy to increase the number of foreign uh, talents. When the number becomes very large, that it is a challenge to nation building. What is the melting pot concept, in fact, was not really working in Singapore. Therefore, there was a debate that whether or not the concept would be continue, I mean, the policy of melting pot. But by 1995, Li Shenlong, then he was the deputy, he was not yet uh, the Prime Minister, announced the policy, announced a new policy in which he stated that Singapore no longer subscribed to melting pot policy. Singapore from now on, in fact, were adopting a new policy. This is called cultural mosaic. And it is also known as salad bowl policy. These two terms were used in the United States, in fact. In fact, in the United States, the melting pot policy was already abandoned. Then we also discover that it didn't work in this part of the world. We also abandoned the, the policy. Between uh, Mr. Go Chok Tong and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, there were also a discussion, a debate. And both agrees that it was impossible to establish an ethno nation. Because at one time, the ideas of establish, establishing the Singapore nation was perhaps like ethno nation, like Japan. But it was, I think, impossible to establish that kind of a nation. And then if you do not use Japan as a model, the who else that you want to use? So it was discovered perhaps that there was no possible to establish or to build a kind of Singapore tribe. This is the term used by Go Chok Tong. The policy changed and then 
what was emphasized at that particular time was the shared values. Through the value integration, then you would be able to build a new nation. But you do not have to erase ethnicity. You try to look for commonalities among the ethnic groups, among the religions, and then based on that, you build the shared value and also a kind of a national concept. In addition to this, it also used meritocracy in order to hold the multi-ethnic group together. But it seems to me that most important, perhaps, was the, emph the emphasis on citizenship. I would like to suggest that Singapore from that time onward, in fact, was emphasizing or stressing 